Um, Kate, it's great to chat with you on this. Um, in the U.S., at least, if you get emergency authorization, you can just get the vaccine out to the public faster. What kind of mechanism does the U.K. have to do that? We've got a similar me uh, mechanism, Alex. So um, it's called Regulation 174, and it's a procedure that allows us to, um, or the NHRA, which is our regulator, the Medicines, Health, Products and Regulatory Agency, allows them to give conditional approval and add conditions on, um, to whatever uh, vaccine they may um, allow to be um, given to the public. So it's a similar approach. Um, I prefer not to use the word emergency use because it signals you know, panic and lack of due process. And in fact, due process is being um, followed and safety is paramount. Um, so I prefer the language conditional approval. Um, we have seen a number of trials halted, paused, should I say, over the last few days. Uh, Pfizer is pushing on. It has an mRNA product. Some of the vectors with some of the others are looking like uh, they could be causing problems. What is your assessment of the timeline currently, Cade? So the, we've got, um, as far as the UK is concerned, um, we have two vaccines that um, will have recruited their target phase three cohorts. Um, in the next few weeks. That's um, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine. And, of course, over in the U.S., you have Moderna as well, which is in that front-running category. So that we can be quite firm on in terms of the timing of uh, recruitment uh, finishing. The bit we can be much less uh, firm on is what are the number of infections in the different clinical trial cohorts, because that is what will determine whether or not we can show statistically that people who have received the vaccine are protected versus those people who have received um, only the control. And that is um, what the regulators want to see, is that statistical benefit for, uh, for the vaccine. So say we do get that then, I mean, and we see that one vaccine has better stats than the other. How do we go about who gets what vaccine? So in the UK, um, this will ultimately be a decision based, uh, given, made by the Department of Health, our, our, the government. But we have a committee um, called the Joint uh, Committee of Vaccinations and Immunisation, which is a bit like your APIC committee in the US. Um, and they give the government advice on the prioritisation um, of those people that they think uh, uh, should receive the vaccine first. Um, the preliminary advice that the JCVI has given to the UK government is that the first priority is care home residents and care home workers. Second priority is frontline healthcare workers and the over 80s. And then it goes down in age order, um, with including um, adults with severe and moderate underlying health disorders. So that is the preliminary advice that we've been given in the UK, but that will obviously still be subject to the final data from the clinical trials, which will indicate whether um, any of these vaccines work in those different cohorts. Kate, can you give us an assessment of how difficult the logistics are in distributing the vaccine? From what I understand, you need a cold chain from production all the way through to putting these things into people's arm. How hard is that going to be and how quickly will it be able to be ramped up? So, Guy, you're quite right. This is a major logistical challenge. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, one that I'm not responsible for. So, again, in, in the UK, <laughs> it's the Department of Health that is responsible for it. All I can say is I think we have a crackerjack team. Um, they are uh, working to do dummy runs and, you know, work through how the vaccines get distributed but, to all okay. parts of society, including the frail elderly, which is, is going to be challenging. Can I, can I just follow up on that? Where is the bulk of the vaccine that we are likely to use in the UK being produced? Um, it depends uh, which vaccine. So the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is being made in the UK. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has two supply chains, a US supply chain and a European mm. supply chain. And those are the first two that um, could be potentially available in, um, in the UK. Um, and then in the US, of course, with Moderna, they have a, an established US supply chain and they have, they've got a um, European supply chain coming close behind. A uh, question on the next steps for vaccines. So say we get, you know, I, I don't know how many, maybe five or six vaccines uh, in this first round from all the different companies. Did the companies then just stop making vaccines? I read an article over the weekend that talked about how um, oftentimes the second, third, fourth reiteration of vaccines can actually be a lot more effective than the first, but that if we rush the process now, we won't get those second, third, fourth iterations. Well, I think 
think there are two questions there. One is, um, will we be able to continue to develop those um, second, third, fourth iterations? And, the, and how can you do that? Because, of, of course, if you are vaccinating everybody, you won't be able to include those people in, in trials. So the way we think about that is by finding and defining immune correlates of protection. So if you can take a vaccine that has been approved and has gone through a big placebo-controlled uh, trial and they've demonstrated that they are able to uh, protect against infection, then a, a, an equivalent vaccine can show the regulators if they can replicate those same correlates, so that's the same neutralizing antibodies and maybe the same CD8 counts, if they can show an equivalent immune response, then the regulators consider whether or not um, with sufficient safety data, they might be prepared to license on the back of basically what's called immune correlate of protection data rather than the full efficacy data. But actually the, an important point is that we don't think this is likely to be a, a virus that or a vaccine that is a one and done. So it's much more likely that the immunity will wane over time and therefore we're going to have to give additional revaccination to maintain that immunity against this virus. And if that's the case, actually those subsequent um, second, third and fourth generation vaccines could uh, play a very important role in providing what may be a different type of immunity which could provide a broader protection mm -hmm. and again uh, the durability of protection. So just that a vaccine doesn't get approved in the next few months does not mean it doesn't have a role um, in controlling uh, and maintaining our protection against this virus. Kate, how many people need to take the vaccine for it to be effective in the community? Um, and how do we convince people that it is the right thing to do? Well, I think that's a really important point about uh, vaccine hesitancy and people being concerned about should they take the first vaccine that's offered and what about all these, these various um, claims that are made uh, about potential health risks of the vaccines. So the first thing I would say is that all the clinical trials that have been run in the West and, you know, the US, Europe, UK, um, have been done against um, pre-established, agreed safety um, and efficacy standards. And there have been no shortcuts whatsoever in the safety um, evaluation of, the, of these vaccines. And in fact, it's the opposite. These, these vaccine studies are significantly larger than typical vaccine studies. Um, precisely so that safety can be very well um, evaluated, which is what we've seen when, we've, um, when we see clinical trials being put on hold or pausing, because in these very large um, studies, for example, the, the J&J study is 60,000 people. It is inevitable that in those 60,000, there will be cases of, of um, disease um, that emerge that are unrelated to the vaccine. But even if they are unrelated, the experts and independent experts have to assess every single safety event to ensure that it is safe to continue dosing the vaccine. So what I would say to the, to the people who are hesitant about vaccines is look at the factual and clear information which is being given by the physicians and, and those who are um, in authority running these clinical trials. Because the pharmaceutical companies, by and large, are mostly doing this at non-profit pricing so this is not something that is being pushed through for commercial reasons. Um, everybody wants to get the pandemic finished as soon as we possibly can and get back to life as we used to know it um, and, and to do so uh, safely. So um, we certainly in the UK are spending a lot of time thinking about and working with the Department of Health and the, the, our colleagues in DCMS who work with the big tech companies to try and address some of the um, anti-vax statements as well as some of the propaganda um, relating to vaccines, which is just simply false. 